Let's talk about Numenor. This is one of the most hardcore, epic things that Tolkien ever wrote. There is nothing else like it. The downfall of Numenor is balls to the wall wild. But when it comes to adapting Numenor for a TV show, there is a problem. Tolkien did not write this story as a novel. The downfall of Numenor's source material is basically a single chapter in the Silmarillion and a few paragraphs and a few timelines in the appendices. Also, almost all of that Silmarillion chapter is an amazingly mythological finale told in epic detail, but it's the ending. Which means there is simply no way of adapting that without first inventing some storylines to get us there. So the Numenor problem is this. How can a writer invent Numenorean characters and storylines in a Tolkien adaptation while still keeping those inventions Tolkienian? Well, I feel that all invented storylines will always fall into one of two categories. Either the made up stuff will be projected onto Tolkien's writings, or it will be drawn out of them. And without wanting to sound preachy, the second option is definitely better. So. How does the Numenor story end? Well, the answer is in the title. It ends with a downfall. But seriously, no casual fan could possibly see it coming. What Tolkien actually wrote is insane. Which means, in my mind, the point of all invented storylines featuring any Numenorean characters should be written with that finale in mind. Everything should be about getting us to the point where that astounding ending can be justified in the vein that Tolkien intended it. And my god, what an ending it is. Super brief version, the bad Numenorians rebel so hard against the Valar, that's sort of like the gods of Tolkien's mythology, that they sail into the undying lands and declare war upon the uttermost west. They try to seize deathlessness through conquest. And in so doing, they invoke the wrath of the One. The All-Father, the power that is beyond even the Valar, Iluvatar. The creator of everything, the guy who gave life to elves and dwarves and men, the supreme being who is ever present yet seldom seen. Until the men of Numenor piss him off to such an extent that he opens up a great chasm in the ocean, he throws back the land, breaks the flat earth and makes it round. He removes the uttermost west from the circles of the world and he drowns the entire island of Numenor beneath the waves, aka Apocalypse. So yeah, not like The Hobbit, but if we make the right decisions with season 3, that could be the finale of season 4. And despite what I've heard said in some parts of the internet, I do not believe this is unadaptable. If we work backwards with that as our end goal and we use Tolkien's writings as our guide, I truly believe we could set up, potentially, the most badass season finale of any TV show ever. So let's explore how a Numenorean storyline might look if the engine of Amazon Prime's adaptation was fueled by a good faith understanding of Tolkien's themes and his characters, instead of, you know, their own thing. Maya Govan and Melanine, and welcome to another How the Rings of Power Might Have Been Written video. And friends, don't take this too seriously. I'm not hating on anything. In fact, I'm not really talking about the show at all. I'm talking about Numenor and Tolkien's Second Age and the nature of adaptation. And just before I begin, this video was written and recorded and made before any episode of The Rings of Power aired, so I haven't yet seen the show. 
And that's kind of the point of why I'm making this now. In the comments of my last video about how I think the Elven storylines could be adapted, I had a few people ask me, some more politely than others, why I didn't just wait until the show aired and then criticise what they actually wrote. And it's a good question, to be fair, but it kind of misses the point of what I'm trying to do here. I am not fixing what the showrunners actually created, I'm acutely aware that taking someone else's body of work and fixing it, or improving it in air quotes, is infinitely easier than taking a blank page and turning that into a body of work. So, out of respect for the creative process, and I guess as a courtesy to the showrunners, that's not what I'm doing. I'm not trying to imply that their version will be wrong and mine will be right, only time will tell. What I'm doing is simply illustrating what a Second Age show could look like if the writings of Tolkien took precedent over the, you know, Amazon Prime agenda, whatever that is. And I want to thoroughly debunk the idea that the show can't be good and faithful at the same time. It absolutely can. Anyway, as I said in my last video, if we look at the trajectory of Tolkien's Second Age story, we will see that it is fundamentally a trilogy. It begins as an epic tale about elves and their conflict with Sauron. Then it shifts to an epic tale about men and their conflict with Sauron. And finally it ends with an epic tale about an alliance of elves and men and their conflict with Sauron. And the story of Numenor is the darker, edgier, middle part of that trilogy. It is the Empire Strikes Back of Tolkien's Second Age. Which means I really don't think we want to be featuring characters like Elendil, Isildur, Miriel, or Farazon in Seasons 1 and 2. Instead, they should be the stars of Seasons 3 and 4. And the story being told in these middle seasons should not shy away from the fact that it's taking place over a thousand years after the events of Seasons 1 and 2. I've already talked about my scepticism concerning the time compression, I won't go on a rant about that now, but I will say, as an example of why it annoys me so much, we know from this officially released image, in Season 1, Miriel will be hanging out with Galadriel. But in this image, we know that Galadriel will be hanging out with Elrond, and in this image, we know that Elrond will be hanging out with Celebrimbor. But Celebrimbor and Miriel are separated by well over a thousand years. It's ludicrous. However, for the sake of being balanced, let me reiterate that the downfall of Numenor is not a novel. It's 27 pages in a book that the showrunners claim they don't have the rights to. It's a couple of sentences in the appendices. And of the very limited source material that we do have to work with, almost all of it only tells the latter part of this Numenor storyline in any detail. Elendil and Isildur aren't even mentioned until it's almost over. So what I'm saying is, there's simply no way to adapt the story without inventing some things. The idea that Tolkien purists, and by the way, what is a Tolkien purist? What is pure Tolkien? I have no idea what that phrase even means. Anyway, the idea that Tolkien purists are advocating for a show with absolutely no changes of any kind is a total straw man argument. No one with any understanding of Tolkien's writings would ever make that argument because it's nonsense. However, there are respectful ways to adapt these writings, even without the rights to the Silmarillion, and there are also terrible ways. So, with all that said, how could Numenor be adapted faithfully? Well, just like with Seasons 1 and 2, Tolkien's Numenor storyline does have an excellent two-act structure, which allows us to split it into Seasons 3 and 4 really easily. I've said it before, but we'll see it in this video too, if we just follow Tolkien's lead in many, many instances, the Second Age kinda adapts itself. So, my thoughts on Season 4 are that it should basically just follow the downfall of Numenor as faithfully as possible. But in Season 3, we need to get there. We need to introduce the characters and the themes and the locations and the storylines which should then be very faithfully showcased in Season 4. Something that could very well be among the greatest seasons of any TV show ever. But to do that, we are going to have to invent some things in Season 3. And so this got me thinking, what is it that an invented storyline should be trying to do? What makes some invented storylines good and others bad? Well, I would say that there are a few factors that a made-up storyline has to include to justify its existence, and a few rules that can't be broken. And at the very heart of it all, these storylines have to exist for a reason. 
To illustrate what I mean, here's uh, an imperfect metaphor. Imagine Tolkien's writings are trees in a forest, and made up storylines are the paths that you have to make to get through it. Now, you can either decide that this is the path that I want to take and any trees in the way of it need to be bulldozed down in order to lay down the metaphorical tarmac of, you know, the message or whatever. Or you can look to the trees themselves and use them to inspire the way that your path weaves among them. Invented storylines are necessary, but they must not be projected onto Tolkien's writings. They must be drawn out of them. And they need to serve a purpose. Now, I wouldn't say there's like one correct purpose here, but I think every invented storyline or character has to serve at least one of these functions. They could perhaps expand on a character that Tolkien created but didn't write much about. They could explore some relevant part of Middle-earth and thus enrich the history and the lore of the story that's being told. Or they could set up a future storyline and kind of unite different threads of Second Age writings. I guess the more of these boxes that an invented storyline ticks, the better it will be, unless it breaks one of the cardinal rules. Firstly, it must not contradict what Tolkien wrote in published works. Secondly, it must be relevant to the story being told. If it's not about Numenor or the Rings of Power, it shouldn't be present. So as much as I enjoy the Blue Wizards and Balrogs and Tom Bombadil and things like that, they just don't belong in this adaptation. And it must feel Tolkienian. The themes being explored must gel with the themes that Tolkien explored and not grind against them. So, as I put this video together, I am trying to keep all of that in my mind. Anyway, if you are sitting comfortably, let's finally begin. Let's go into my version of how the Numenorian storyline in Amazon's The Rings of Power could have been written for seasons 3 and 4. So, season 3, episode 1. We begin with a cold opening. And for you guys who saw my last video about seasons 1 and 2, this will be very familiar. I think season 3 should begin with a slightly different perspective on the exact same scene that season 1 began with. Two characters in dialogue. One an exceptionally old looking king, the other incredibly youthful, right on the cusp of maturity. The topic of their conversation should be all about the central theme of the entire show, which will be even more important in seasons 3 and 4 than it was in 1 and 2, and that is, in Tolkien's own words, death and the desire for deathlessness. You can't adapt Numenor without a watertight focus on Tolkien's most crucial theme. Every storyline should be, in some way, an exploration of death and the desire for deathlessness. However, through the dialogue between these two characters, we discover that the old man and the young man are in fact twin brothers. They're the same age. The old king is the mortal man Elros, also known as Tarminiatur, the first ever king of Numenor, and the young man is his immortal brother Elrond, who is only 500 years old in this scene. And the most important thing that Elros does in this story is demonstrate what a healthy relationship with death and deathlessness looks like. Elros lived 500 years of his life and now he is voluntarily relinquishing that life. He is choosing to enter death. And it's not sad, it is bittersweet, but death is a gift in the mind of Elros. The alternative, mortals living forever, that would be awful. And so Elros entrusts his spirit, his Fea, to the One, to Iluvatar, that power which dwells beyond the circles of the world, and Elros willingly enters death. However, whereas in Season 1 we explored this from Elrond's point of view, in Season 3 we should see the exact same events through the eyes and ears of Elros's Numenorian great-grandson, who in the appendices, which the showrunners totally have the rights to, is called Elendil. But not that Elendil. This is the first Elendil. Anyway, Elros lays down his life, Elrond speaks with this Elendil guy, and he acknowledges that he is, and always will be, kin. All descendants of Elros are Elrond's family. 
Then, Elrond departs from Numenor, but whereas at the beginning of Season 1, the story stayed with him, and we followed him to Middle-earth, where we spent Seasons 1 and 2 interacting with Gil-galad and Celebrimbor and Galadriel, in Season 3, the story should stay in Numenor. Elendil watches Elrond depart, and as the camera lingers on this descendant of Elros, our voiceover prologue begins. I said in the last video, the Second Age is 3,441 years long, and this timeline should be an asset to any adaptation, not something to be compressed. And so, every scene of every episode of every season needs to have an answer to this question. Which year of those 3,441 does this scene take place in? By beginning Season 3 with the death of Elros again, we are establishing that the cold opening begins right at the start of the Second Age, in the year 441. And that's not some deep cut from some book that we don't have the rights to, that's what Tolkien wrote in The Return of the King's Appendices. But what we need now is a good old time jump. Not time compression, these years should happen, they matter, they are part of the history of the story, and what happens in these years is fundamentally what's being explored throughout all of Season 3. So, I reckon the prologue should skip forward 2,813 years, which I know is a crazy amount of time to jump through in the beginning of the first episode, and some of you may very well be disappointed that I'm not spending more time on those millennia before Numenor's main storyline, but I would justify this decision by arguing that all Tolkien ever really wrote about Numenor during that earlier period, certainly in what we have the rights to, is simply a list of different kings and queens and a few facts about a very gradual decline line and corruption, so these facts should be what the prologue is exploring, but I just feel if we're going to make stuff up, we should be spending the limited seasons available focusing that invention on the characters who will provide the momentum of Numenor's greatest storyline, instead of, you know, just writing a documentary about a list of kings. But what's cool is that in Tolkien's writings, the very gradual tensions that take 2,800 years to bubble into open conflict do then very rapidly repeat themselves in the five years following that date that I believe the prologue should jump forward to. So the five years that make up season three really are a microcosm of the 2,800 years that preceded it. Anyway, what year should we jump to? Well, in my opinion, the answer is the year 3255, which if you're keeping track is 1,554 years after the end of Season 2, which would be a massive problem if Seasons 1 and 2 included a bunch of irrelevant made-up storylines involving mortal half for example, but if the invented path is inspired by Tolkien's metaphorical trees, this won't be an issue. Every surviving character from Seasons 1 and 2 should be an immortal. So they're still kicking around in Middle-earth, they're just one and a half thousand years older now. Not really a big deal if you're a timeless, ageless being. However, next question, what actually happens in this prologue? I'll admit, 2,813 years of history is not easy to concisely convey, but I think it can be done if we keep laser focus on what's important to this story, and we resist the urge to try and include everything that Tolkien ever mentioned. It should all begin with that great-grandson of Elros's, Tar-Elendil, fourth king of Numenor. As we see the visuals of the prologue appear on screen, we should hear a man's voice narrating this story, and telling the history of his country and his people. Which begins with Tar-Elendil's eldest child being born. The first-born great-great-grandchild of Elros. However, she is a woman, Silmarien. Under the laws of Numenor that existed way back in the beginning, a woman could not inherit the ruling scepter of the king. So instead, Silmarien inherits a new scepter, a silver scepter, and her child becomes the first lord of Arndunie, a branch of Numenor's royal line, a direct descendant of Elros, but not the ruling line. That's important. Instead, Silmarien's younger brother becomes the next king, but Silmarien inherits two other heirlooms to pass down to her descendants, the First Age Ring of Barahir 
and the First Age sword, Narsil. And this royal split, these two lines, the Numenorean kings and the lords of Andunier, the two scepters, they established the two very philosophically distinct factions of Numenoreans whose conflict over death and deathlessness is what we're exploring in both like the macro and the micro of this Numenor story. But then the prologue keeps going, and we move through thousands of years of Numenor's history by seeing king after king after king, all living long lives and then eventually growing old and passing on their scepter before dying. And I think there are two ways that we can visualise this massive passage of time. First, over these thousands of years we should see the exponential growth of Numenor's capital city, Armenelos. In the days of Eleros and Elendil, the entire nation of Numenor is only a few hundred years old, and it was established by elf friends. So I think the architecture should reflect that. But as the centuries turn to millennia, we should see that the cities become substantially more awe-inspiring, but also noticeably less elven in appearance. The aesthetic of Numenor should change over the course of this prologue to reflect their gradual move away from elven ideology and their evolution into a supremely powerful but uniquely isolationist island kingdom of men. The other way to visualise this time jump is with the growth of Numenor's great white tree Nimloth. In the days of Silmarien, Nimloth is still a sapling, but as the prologue moves forward this tree should spend 2,000 years growing. And I think the physical health of this tree should reflect the moral and spiritual health of the Numenorean people. In the days of Silmarien it has thousands of flowers, but over time the flowers fade and die. Also, towards the beginning of this prologue we should see that two of the kings are those same two Numenorean guys that I talked about in seasons 1 and 2, Halbrand and his grandson, who befriended Gil-galad and helped defeat Sauron towards the finale of season 2, the invented characters that I based on Aldarion and Kyriatan. We should set up that their actions and relationships back in season 2 with Gil-galad are an important part of Numenor's history, but also they happened one and a half thousand years before the events of this season. So from the perspective of Season 3's major characters, Halbrand was a figure of almost ancient history, and the true story of what he did is, to an extent, lost to the deeps of time. Anyway, second thing to focus on in this prologue is that as Numenor's cities grow and the island becomes enriched by thousands of years of prosperity, so too does its empire. Numenor is not just a place, it's an idea. And across the sea, in Middle-earth, the Numenorians build great colonies, the mightiest of which are Pelargir and Umbar. And these two Numenorian havens can reinforce that dichotomy of Numenor's two factions, the two royal lines, the two philosophies, death and the desire for deathlessness. The Numenorians of Pelargir have a fundamentally different outlook to the Numenorians of Umbar, at least at first they do. And it is through these colonies in Middle-earth that the island of Numenor acquires so much of its unparalleled wealth and power. But as the centuries pass we should begin to see that the imperial mindset is changing. In the beginning the Numenorean colonists were friends and teachers to the indigenous middlemen of Middle-earth, but by the end of the prologue the Numenorians, particularly of Umbar, have turned into conquerors and plunderers and tyrants. And whilst all of that is happening, Middle-earth is turning into a darker place than we remember it. Numenorians are shunning any and all contact with the elves, and the Southlands are slowly becoming more and more overrun with orcs. The shadow of Sauron is slowly rising again in the south. And the final thread of this prologue should introduce the slow decline and the philosophical divide that threatens to sunder all of Numenorean culture, and I think the perfect lens through which to explore this is language. 
I said in my last video that the common tongue of season one, you know, the language that the show translates into English, or whatever language you're watching it in, should be the elven tongue, Sindarin. But in seasons three and four, that would not be the case. Although the opening dialogue between Elros and Elrond would be spoken in Sindarin, so I think potentially it might be cool to begin season three with like the exact same scene from season one and keep the dialogue the same, but this time the actors aren't saying it in English, they're saying it in Sindarin and the viewer is reading it through subtitles. That isn't essential, I'm aware subtitles probably don't track well with certain focus groups, but what I'm saying is that a solid grasp on language is a massively important part of any adaptation of J.R.R. Professor of Language Tolkien's writings. And by having that first scene spoken in Sindarin, we can demonstrate the extent to which things evolve, or perhaps I should say devolve, over the span of this 2800 year prologue. Because by the year 3255, Sindarin is no longer the common tongue of Numenor, and it shouldn't be the language that the show translates into English. That language should be Adunaic. If a character speaks Adunaic, their actor should speak English. If not, I think we should use subtitles. And all of this is relevant to the plot because over the span of this prologue, the kings and queens of Numenor switch from having Quenya names like Tar Elendil or Tar Aldarion, Tar Ancalime, to Adunayic names like Aradunakor or Arzimrathon, Argimilzor. You can hear the difference. But just as Tolkien made clear in his non compressed timeline, our narrator should explain how gradual this change is. First, the elven tongue is generally renounced in day-to-day -day speech, then centuries later it's officially abandoned, then by the end of the prologue it is forbidden by law and even persecuted. Elven influence is very slowly yet very aggressively faded out of Numenorean culture, and the elven visitors who once came bearing gifts from the undying lands, including that white tree Nimloth at the beginning of the prologue, are now no longer welcome in Numenor. And as this prologue ends, we finally see the face of the man who is narrating it. And we learn that what we've just seen is a visual representation of a father telling a bedtime story to his two young children, to his sons. It is a history of their homeland. And as the story ends, the father pulls his two sons close and he whispers something to both of them in the elven tongue. He establishes that he does not subscribe to the anti-elvish sentiment that's been growing in Numenor for two and a half thousand years. He is an elf friend, one of the faithful, and he's raising his sons to be that way too. He can then put the boys to bed, and as he leaves them to sleep, we can reveal that upon his finger, he wears the ring of Barahir, and at his side is the blade Narsil. This man is the direct descendant of Silmarien. He is the current lord of Arnadunie, an advisor to the king Elendil. The other Elendil, the famous Elendil, which means, of course, his two children are Isildur and Anarion, the Numenorians who are destined to one day become the founding kings of Gondor. So then we should probably do like the opening credits or whatever, and after that, the words 30 years later should appear on the screen. And the only reason that I'm skipping 30 years here is just that I think we should see Isildur and Anarion here, this elf friend version of their history while they're still children. You know, it's a story they grew up with. But as I already said, season three should properly begin in the year 3255. And by that year, Isildur is 46, Anarion is 36, and Elendil is 136 years old. Although obviously they're all Numenorians, so they all look a good bit younger than that. Anyway, Elendil, Isildur, and Anarion should definitely be three of our most major, major characters throughout all of season three and four. Just as in seasons one and two, every part of the story revolved around our four main Elven characters, I think the Numenor storyline should revolve around six main Manish characters, and they should be the ones dictating the trajectory of the story. 
I think it would be a massive mistake to feature Elendil and Isildur and Anarion, but then dilute their importance by including like, you know, 20 other main characters and a dozen other storylines. Focus should be key. And in my opinion, Elendil should be the most crucial of all the characters in this storyline. He is such a pivotal part of the late Second Age, and he is one of the primary hinges that connects the Second Age to the Third Age. Which, to be fair, the guys creating this Rings of Power show do seem to be aware of. He shouldn't be in Season 1, and I don't love that he's wearing plate armour, but apart from that, Prime's version of Elendil is perhaps the thing that I'm most optimistic about. I've been impressed with the actor's interviews. I get the impression that he appreciates who Elendil is. Because, of course, there is a reason that in 3,000 years time, Aragorn will shout Elendil's name as his battle cry. There is a reason that Tolkien tells us in the appendices, Sauron hated Elendil more than any other. He is the Lord of Andunie. He is the eldest child of the eldest child of the eldest child going all the way back to Elros, first ever king. Elendil is a vital part of Numenor's royal line, but he's not of the ruling line. He is the king's friend, the king's advisor, he is adjacent to the throne, but he does not sit upon it. And Elendil is also the leader of the faithful, the elf friends of Numenor who reject that desire for deathlessness, who remember the old days when elves and men made each other better. Anyway, after the opening credits, we should introduce our fourth main Numenorean character, Miriel, the daughter and heir of Numenor's current king, Tar Palantir. And the most important thing about Tar Palantir is that he is an exception to that whole Numenorean kings taking Adonaic names rule. Tar Palantir is a highly atypical king. His reign is entirely unrepresentative of what we saw Numenor growing into in the prologue. Tar Palantir is an elf friend. We probably don't have the rights to go into specifics, but during his reign, Palantir repented of the deeds of his forefathers, and he tried, unsuccessfully, to return Numenor to the days of Elros, and the original Elendil, and Silmarien. Which is why I said that the five years that make up season three are basically just a massively sped up replay of what's already happened over the past 2,800 years. We start with the elf friends once again in charge, a king with a Quenya name, but it will not end that way. Anyway, by the year 3255, Tar Palantir is a very old king, and his days are clearly numbered. It's only a matter of time before his daughter Miriel succeeds him and she takes up the ruling scepter. I know in the prologue we established that Silmarien was overlooked as queen for being a woman, but that was then, this is thousands of years later, the law has changed and there have been a number of Numenorean queens since then. Anyway, through Miriel's interactions with her father, we should set up two things, character and plot. I imagine Miriel and Palantir walking together through the streets of Armenelos and coming maybe to the eerie of the last great eagle left on the island. In the prologue we can see that great eagles were common in Numenor during the days of Silmarien, they are agents of the Valar, but now there is only one left. And it is the duty of Numenor's king to tend to this eagle. So Palantir and Miriel bring it food and they present it in a fairly ritual way. I think ritual should be a fairly important part of seasons three and four. This has like an almost religious significance to it. And as they're doing this, Miriel and Palantir have a conversation about the future, but it's also about the past. In Numenor, future and past are kind of like two sides of the same coin. Through Tar Palantir's dialogue, we learn that although he embodies the philosophy of the faithful, there are so many Numenorians who do not accept his philosophy. Tension and division is rife in Numenor, and among a very decent portion of his people, Tar Palantir is considered a heretic king, who is betraying the true mannish Numenor by allowing elven influence to exist there. Among the population of Numenor, there is a large and sinister underground cult of elf haters, 
the opposite of the faithful who were once the guys in charge and now resent being ruled by a king with an elvish name. And one of the most important themes in the entire Numenor story should be opposites exchanging places. If you want to turn seasons 3 and 4 into like a drinking game, take a shot every time we see opposites exchanging places. You'll be pretty wrecked by the end of it. By the end of season 3, the elf haters will be the ones in charge. They will be the king's men. And the good guy, faithful Numenorians, will be reduced to a minority shadow organization living in secret and resisting the authority of Numenor's new ruler. However, this scene definitely should not exist solely for exposition's sake. Miriel is going to be a hugely significant character in this storyline, so we should get to establish her personality and a bit of what makes her tick. I think Miriel has the potential to be really interesting because, kinda like Galadriel, I believe her characterization can, to an extent, be summed up as a coming together of two seemingly contradictory concepts. On the one hand, she is the daughter of Tar Palantir. She has an elvish name, she has a respect for elvish culture and a sympathy for the faithful, but she is not of Silmarian's line. She is of the ruling line of Silmarian's brother. She is the heir of those Adunayak speaking kings who spent millennia slowly moving Numenor away from elven influence. So I think this unanswered question should be at the core of Miriel's character. Who does she have more in common with? Her father, Tar Palantir, and her distant ancestors Eleros and Tar Elendil, or her much more recent and much more numerous ancestors with the Adunayak names? I don't think even Miriel herself would yet know the answer to that. And of course the other very important thing about Miriel is that Tar Palantir had her really late in his life and he's super old now. So it's only a matter of time before he dies and she becomes the one that all of Numenor looks to. The nation is so divided and yet it is Miriel's duty to somehow move everyone forward. To take the bitterness of the past and forge it into a future for all Numenorians. Much easier said than done. Anyway, episode 1 also needs to introduce the adult versions of our other central characters, specifically Isildur and his younger brother Anarion. Now, you do not need me to tell you that these guys are going to be super important, but this story is beginning 186 years before Isildur will eventually cut the ring from Sauron's finger, so we are meeting these characters at a very different time in their lives. And as I've already said, we are going to have to invent most of this storyline. Isildur doesn't get his first mention by Tolkien until the very end of the Numenor story, and Anarion isn't even mentioned until after that. But by looking at who we know he's going to grow into, I think Isildur could be one of the most interesting characters in the entire show. And Anarion is a great character to explore too. Because throughout all the writings Tolkien gives us later, we see that Isildur and Anarion are kind of like two halves of one whole. It is Isildur and Anarion who are represented in the Argonath. Together they will found the kingdom of Gondor. Their descendants will set up the two royal lines of the Dúnedain in the Third Age. Their thrones in Osgiliath will be set beside each other. Their cities, Minas Anor and Minas Ithil, will be built opposite each other. And of course, these cities will go on to be much more famously known as Minas Tirith and Minas Morgul. Also, even their names demonstrate just how similar, yet simultaneously different, these two brothers are from each other. What Anarion means is son of the sun, and what Isildur means is servant of the moon. So, from the information Tolkien gives us, I think we can draw out two very interesting personalities. 
I imagine Anarion as being a little bit like a younger version of, say, Boromir. He's charismatic, he's a warrior, and his association with the sun makes me think of someone who's very bold and very bright, fiery and extroverted. However, one way in which Anarion is of course different from Boromir is that he is the younger of the two brothers, so I don't think he'd have the same degree of obligation or duty that a firstborn son might have. He can be a little bit more light-hearted. Life's not as serious for him. Isildur, on the other hand, makes me think much more of Faramir, except if Faramir were the elder brother. Isildur's connection to the moon implies a much more modest, but also potentially more profound character. And whereas in Tolkien's writings, the sun is always very much associated with the race of men, the moon is associated with elves. And I think a Isildur should have a bit of an elven air about him. He is the heir of Elendil, leader of the faithful, and from a big picture perspective, Isildur is probably the most important Numenorean ever to live. And one other thing that I believe is incredibly important to establish early, and something I really hope the TV show gets right, is that Isildur is not, and never will be, a bad guy. He's not edgy, he's not a rebel, he's not corrupt, this is not the origin story of a villain, any unintentionally negative consequences of his actions towards the end of the show will be infinitely more impactful if we establish early on that Isildur is up there with Aragorn as one of the most wonderful mortals ever to live in Middle-earth. We need to portray Isildur the way Tolkien wrote him, as opposed to the way Peter Jackson adapted him. Isildur is a hero. Anyway, I guess the topic of Isildur and Anarion's first conversation in the show should be the far-off lands of Middle-earth. A place that neither of them have ever actually been to, but they've heard so much about it from sailors returning from the colonies. And just as in seasons 1 and 2, our only glimpses of Numenor were through a Middle-earth elvish perspective, in seasons 3 and 4 we should only really see Middle-earth through a Numenorean perspective. And the perspective that these two young Numenoreans would have should be entirely inspired by the stories they've grown up hearing. Over a thousand years ago, back in season 2, a Numenorean king sailed to Middle-earth with a great fleet to declare war on the mysterious Dark Lord Sauron. But that was season 2. That's ancient history now. And that story that we explored in Season 2 should have two tellings in Season 3. There is a faithful perspective where the Numenorians and the Elves of Gil-galad fought together in a glorious union, the first alliance, but there's also a darker version, where the focus of the story is on Numenorean supremacy and the wickedness of the Elves, who are blessed with immortality yet don't deserve it. The point of this dialogue isn't exposition, it's just an opportunity to explore young Isildur and Anarion's fascination with the lands that we know they are going to end up ruling. And also, it's another example of how death and the desire for deathlessness have created two very different ideas of what it is to be a Numenorean. Anyway, after this scene, I think we should stay with Isildur and use him to introduce our fifth main character, a character that Amazon Prime has invented and called Aardian. Now, Aardian is entirely made up, she does not exist in any of Tolkien's writings, but as I said, this story cannot be told without inventing some new storylines, and I think there's a really interesting potential for a young Numenorean woman called Aardian who has an intimate familial relationship with Isildur. However, in Amazon Prime's The Rings of Power, Aardian will be Isildur's sister, and that is bad adaptation. That is a metaphorical tarmac path that bulldozes the trees of Tolkien's writings. Isildur cannot have a sister. That's law-breaking. And the reason why this is so, so silly is because of that isildur Anarion dyad that I mentioned a moment ago. The fact that Elendil has two children is significant. There are two royal lines of the Dúnedain. There are two cities of Minas Tirith and Minas Morgul. There are two thrones in Osgiliath. There are two kingdoms in exile. There are two Argonath statues. 
By saying that Elendil had three children, but the daughter had absolutely no legacy whatsoever and her contributions to Middle-earth are entirely absent, it's just a bit of a waste. I suppose the Rings of Power might kill her off before the downfall of Numenor, but even if they do, that still leaves a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. Are we expected to believe that Isildur and Anarion had a sister, and Elendil had a daughter, but she died and then no one created any kind of monument for her? There's no evidence that she ever existed. Surely, that's more sexist than not including her. The theme of family is massively important in the founding of Gondor and Arnor, and so inventing a superfluous member of that family, but then implying she had nothing to do with the thing that her family is most famous for doing, the most iconic legacy of the Dúnedain, the reason the heirs of Elendil matter, what, they just don't apply to her? Eardian's life amounts to nothing? Is that really the feminist message I imagine the showrunners are trying to inject with this character? Obviously, I've not seen it yet, I could be wrong, but I really don't think Isildur or Anarion should have a sister. However, I do think Eardian has huge potential to be a great addition to the story, she just needs to be written slightly differently. If you're gonna invent a female Numenorean main character with a close relationship to Isildur, then surely, obviously, that character should be Isildur's future wife. Isildur's wife is never named by Tolkien, she's never even mentioned, but we know she must have existed. Isildur had four children. That could not be the case without the involvement of a woman. Also, despite the fact that we know nothing about her, Isildur's wife is a hugely important character from like a big picture perspective. As the mother of Isildur's children, she will go on to be the matriarch of the royal line of Arnor, and thus an ancestor of all Arnor's kings and all future chieftains of the Dúnedain. You know, Aragorn is as much an heir of Isildur's wife as he is an heir of Isildur. It blows my mind that one of the show's 22 main characters is going to be supposedly some pointless made-up sister when she could instead have been this greatly important woman who will forever change the fate of Middle-earth and absolutely definitely does exist in Tolkien's writings. Am I wrong? I don't know, maybe Isildur will get a wife in the show and I'm just jumping the gun a little bit. Also, of course, it's possible that Aarian could have been Isildur's mother or Anarion's wife, but for the sake of ticking those adaptation boxes, I think the most efficient way to write her character is to make her Isildur's wife. That enriches his character and it allows us to explore new parts of Middle-earth and set up new storylines that will matter massively in the future. Anyway, by the end of the first episode, we should meet our final main character, Farazon. Technically, at this point in the story, he should be known as Gimilkad, but I don't think we have the rights to that name, so I'll just call him Farazon. And Farazon is an absolutely fascinating character. There is no one in the entirety of Tolkien's writings who can really compare to him. Certainly no mortal character. He is a huge part of what makes the Numenor storyline so wonderfully unique and compelling. Because he's simultaneously one of the most important characters, he's an engine of the entire story, he should surely be one of the most psychological characters to feature in the entire show, but he's also unambiguously a straight up villain. There's a really cool opportunity here to spend a lot of time exploring the mind and motives of a villain protagonist. And again, I've not seen the show yet, so I might be wrong, but this is not how I imagine Farazon looking. We learn a lot about him in the Silmarillion, which we may or may not have the rights to, but even in the Lord of the Rings appendices, we get enough information to create a very three-dimensional version of this character. I've heard in an interview that Amazon Prime's version of Farazon is supposed to be like a Numenorean Minister of Social Cohesion, I think, which is not a real job, and supposedly he'll be acting as like Miriel's right-hand man, which is an insane departure from the source material. If there is one fundamental fact that defines Farazon's character, it's that he is a captain of Numenor, the golden captain. He is a warrior, he is a conqueror. In the appendices, he is described as the proudest and most powerful, and no less than the kingship of the world was his desire. Farazon isn't anyone's right-hand man, he's not a minister of social cohesion, he is a uniquely powerful yet prideful figure. He intends to be the king of the world. 
And I really, really believe that in the first episode, Farazon should not be in Numenor. We know that at this point in the story, he's been off in Middle-earth in the Numenorean colonies. While old King Palantir has been waxing philosophic, you know, and feeding eagles, Farazon has been the one making Numenor mighty. Among the darker Numenorians who desire deathlessness and resent the immortality of the elves, Farazon is the captain. He is the one they all look to. And so, Farazon represents a very interesting third piece of the Elendil Miriel Farazon triangle. Farazon is Miriel's cousin, and thus he is the nephew of King Palantir. However, Farazon's father was the absolute opposite of his brother Palantir. He was the leader of those rebels. It's Palantir's own brother who led the sinister, shadowy, elf-hating faction of Numenorians, and Farazon is very much his father's son. He is the most extreme example of that toxic Numenorian supremacy that is so central to this part of Tolkien's writings. Elendil, of course, he stands at the complete opposite end of the spectrum. He is the Lord of Andunie, the leader of the faithful. He represents the legacy of Silmarien and even Elros before her. He does not desire deathlessness. But right in the middle is Miriel. She could go either way. And so the conflict and the complexity between these three main characters is the conflict and complexity of Numenor over the past 3,000 years. And so, the way that I would introduce Farazon into the show would be to focus on his homecoming to Numenor. The first thing we should see of him is his ship. In Season 2 we saw Numenorean warships, but that was over a thousand years ago. Farazon's ship should dwarf anything we've seen so far. And, as I say, in Adunayak, Farazon means the golden. So this return of the golden captain, the warrior who spent years strengthening the Numenorean colonies abroad and making their nation great, at least by one faction's definition, should be a really big deal for the people of this island. The return of the king's nephew is what gets season three going. Because I know I said that Farazon's father, that's Palantir's brother, was the leader of those elf-hating rebels, but he died before the show began. We don't really have the rights to go into that whole thing. It's cool, but it's not totally relevant. What we do have the rights to is the tension and the sort of civil war that Tolkien tells us was bubbling before Farazon's return. And now that he has returned, the elf-hating, death-fearing faction of corrupt Numenorians now have a new golden captain to look to, a leader of royal descent. So, the first big plot development of season three should be the death of old King Palantir. That's why I'm beginning this series in the year 3255, that's when Palantir dies. I think we can use this moment to explore a sort of sequel to the death of Elros, but this should be sadder. Palantir doesn't quite relinquish his life, instead he runs out of time. And his death is accelerated by the grief he feels over the rebellion and the strife that is marring not only his entire kingdom slash empire, but also his own family. And after Palantir passes, the ruling scepter is inherited by Miriel. She becomes the ruling queen of Numenor. Also, and I'm making this bit up, but I think it would be cool if when Palantir dies, the last great eagle of Numenor should fly west, and one of the last flowers should fall from the white tree Nimloth. With Palantir gone, Numenor's soul balances on a knife's edge, and right in the eye of this epic story storm are three of our six main characters, Elendil, Miriel, Farazon. All this big picture fate of Numenor stuff ultimately boils down to the wants and needs and desires of these three characters. 
So let's get into an overview of that. Although, just before I do, I'm imagining season 3 having two separate but connected storylines. The Elendil Miriel Farazon trio and the Isildur Anarion Aarion trio. So I'll talk about those younger three and what they're up to just a little bit later in this video, but right now I will focus on the older generation. And Tolkien wrote a cool detail about these three characters that could very well be inspiration for some interesting character development among them. Because we know that Miriel, Farazon, and Elendil were all born at around the same time. By the year 3255, Miriel is 138, Farazon is 137, and Elendil is 136. Which means I don't think it's too much of a stretch to suggest that all three of these characters might have all been children together. Farazon and Miriel are of course cousins, but Elendil is also technically family. And although their common ancestor lived like a really long time ago, the Lords of Andunie are chief counsellors to the king. They carry the Silver Scepter, so it's not inconceivable that Elendil might have grown up among Miriel and Farazon, which I think will only make their relationship all the more interesting. Although, as I am sure many of you are already very aware, there is one very important character who I have not yet mentioned, and I've not included in this adaptation, and that is Elendil's father, Armandil. Now the reason I've not included Armandil is simply because he is never mentioned in The Lord of the Rings, his role in the story is pretty Silmarillion specific, and honestly of all the things that are included in that part of the Silmarillion that we should really have the rights to but probably don't, Armandil is not the absolute most crucial, so although it would be great to have him, all the interesting facets of his character and his actions can, I think, still be adequately explored through other characters that we do have the rights to. In the Silmarillion we are told that once upon a time Armandil was a very dear friend to Farazon, and it's only later in life that they became estranged. So in the absence of Armandil, perhaps we can transplant some of that story onto his son Elendil. Especially considering we know Elendil and Farazon were born within only one year of each other, and they would both have spent a good deal of time in the palace of the king. I think we can take these characters in a really interesting direction if we establish that back in the day they used to have a childhood friendship. However, season 3 is not about friendship between these two characters, it should be about how their difference of philosophical opinion brings 3,000 years of history to a breaking point. Perhaps at Palantir's state funeral we can see Miriel face her first challenge as queen. We could see the elf-hating faction of Numenor rearing its ugly head, and we can glimpse the extent to which many people among the Numenorean populace really hated Palantir and what he stood for, and they're waiting to see whether Miriel will be their enemy too. Maybe we can see some sinister, anti-faithful graffiti scrawled on the walls. Maybe we can hear some anti-elven sentiment whispered among the people and just kind of explore the ill will that has spent 3,000 years spreading like a cancer through this otherwise amazingly beautiful island nation. And of course, the one thing that unites all of these anti-faithful Numenorians is their certainty that the great golden Captain Farazon could one day bring about the Numenor they so desperately want. And I think there's a really fine line here that a writer needs to tread, because on the one hand I don't think we want to be humanising Farazon too much, you know, he is not an everyman, he is an absolutely unique specimen, he does something that no other villain in Tolkien's entire legendarium, even Melkor and Sauron, don't rebel against goodness quite like how Farazon rebels. But also, season 3 should be about exploring the psychology of how a guy could go from being an incredibly prideful yet not extraordinarily evil captain into the man we know he will become by the end of season 4. So although Farazon and Elendil hate each other's philosophies, at this very early point in season 3 I think we should at least have a few scenes where we see that there's still some kind of mutual respect between them, if for nothing else than the fact that they were children together. Perhaps we could illustrate this by having Farazon, Miriel, and Elendil all leave the city together and climb to a high point of Numenor's holy mountain, 
Menel Tarama. Now, for law reasons, I definitely don't think they should climb to the summit of this mountain, and what a writer has the legal rights to use will dictate how big of a deal we can make out of Meneltama's spiritual significance and its religious relevance to the worship of Iluvatar, but even without any of that, it's still really important. Maybe our three main characters can stand on some high ledge and look out over Numenor and have a debate about the civil strife that is dividing their people. Farazon can look east, in the direction of the dawn, and he can talk about Middle-earth, a land of wealth and power and opportunity, but also a place of death. Then he turns around, and he looks west, in the direction of deathlessness. We should introduce the Ban of the Valar, the rule that no Numenorian is ever allowed to sail west out of sight of Numenor. They are not allowed access to the Undying Lands. And all three of our major characters can have a different perspective on why this is. Farazon believes that the Ban of the Valar exists solely because the Lords of the Valar in the uttermost west are afraid of the Numenorians. He argues that death is a curse inflicted upon the Numenorians by vengeful gods, because they know that if the Numenorians had the gift of deathlessness, then the Numenorians would be the rulers of the world. According to Farazon, Numenorians are the true lords of the West, and Numenor is so mighty and so great that all the other powers in Arida fear their supremacy. However, Miriel believes the opposite. She was taught by her father that the ban of the Valar must be respected because they are the true lords of the West and there is no power greater than them. But then Elendil, who's been listening along in silence, adds his two cents by saying, there is one with power greater than all things, even the Valar. Now, this highly mythological part of the story is something that I think makes the Numenor storyline relatively unique among Tolkien's other Second and Third Age stories. And considering we know that Season 4 is going to end with Farazon pissing off Iluvatar, the supreme creator of everything, and the world itself will be broken because of it, we should really be setting that up in Season 3. Religion isn't something that features much in Middle-earth's history, but Numenor is kind of the exception. The Valar, the gods, they are an important part of the plot, and so is the capital O-1 who created them. Now, devastatingly, we probably don't have the rights to use the word Iluvatar, although for the purposes of this video I will continue to use it, but in the appendices Tolkien does talk about the Lords of the Valar as a group, and the capital O-1 who changes the world, so we can still adapt his role in the story just without using his name. Also, fun fact, what Iluvatar literally means in Quenya is All Father. And the All Father is of course an Old Norse term pertaining to Odin. It's not protected by copyright, it is indisputably Tolkienian, so even if we can't use the name Iluvatar, we can still include him and we'll just have to call him the All Father. However, I do actually have another storyline in mind in which this kind of divine narrative will be explored a little bit more subtly, so I won't go on about it too much right now. Except to say, Iluvatar and the Valar matter a lot to Elendil, Miriel, and Farazon. Anyway, as season three moves forward, the tensions need to build and build and build until we have two completely irreconcilable factions. And as Farazon gains popularity, his faction becomes larger and larger, until just before the halfway point of season 3, Farazon and his vast faction of rebels decide that they can bear the legacy of Palantir and the faithful no longer. Farazon can declare that Numenor is not made great by some foolish friendship with elves or archaic superstitions of the Elder Days. We are the Lords of the West, he says. We are what makes Numenor great. Death is a curse forced upon us by jealous gods, but because we are so mighty, we can overcome that fate. We will wrest deathlessness from the immortals and take what we are owed. And anyone 
who disagrees, anyone who stands against Farazon's dream of a Numenorian golden age, anyone who resists Numenorian supremacy, is the enemy. In keeping exactly with what Tolkien wrote, Farazon should storm the royal palace with his mob behind him and seize the ruling scepter from his cousin Miriel. I imagine in this moment we would see the first potential for like actual violence between Elendil and Farazon, but Miriel should, I think, put a stop to it. In the Silmarillion we are told that Farazon not only seizes Miriel's ruling scepter, but he also forces her to marry him. That's how he becomes king. And even without the rights to those specifics, I think we can invent a respectful version of that plotline. The Silmarillion tells us that cousins marrying cousins is forbidden under Numenorean law, so this isn't like a legit thing. Farazon's seizure of power is entirely illegal, it's a coup, but it is at least bloodless. And I think this illuminates a potentially interesting detail concerning Miriel's character. She is all about trying to bring the people of Numenor together, trying to find balance between her wildly different ruling ancestors, and doing all in her power to avoid full-blown civil war, something that's been looming for millennia but still hasn't quite materialised. And this is more or less the only power Miriel has in this moment after Farazon seizes her scepter. At least as his loveless wife, she can keep one hand on the wheel. So maybe Miriel goes along with her forced marriage to Farazon, and in so doing we get to explore what is essentially two enemies forcibly united, and both trying to do what's best for the people and the nation of Numenor, despite the fact they have wildly contradictory definitions of what is actually best. But another thing that's quite interesting here is that in all of Tolkien's writings there is never anything even remotely close to sexual violence. Even the most villainous character ever to live isn't a rapist. So Farazon's kind of shot himself in the foot a little bit. He's now stuck with a wife who hates him and will never bear him a child. Farazon now has no way of creating a legacy, no way of creating an heir. When he dies, the story of Farazon will die with him. That is the power of Miriel. She has, to an extent, denied him deathlessness. Anyway, after Farazon usurps the kingship, his followers become the king's men. No longer are they working their malice from the shadows, now they are the ones in charge. Opposites have exchanged places. And through the new policies of Farazon, we get to A, explore his priorities, and B, we get to see firsthand what we skipped over in the prologue. First, the elvish language is once again absolutely forbidden, and anyone who speaks it is now persecuted. Tar Miriel is forced to take an Adunayic name, Ar Zimrathel, or something else if we can't get the rights to that, and I think Elendil should be forced to take an Adunayic name too. In pretty obscure writings that we definitely don't have the rights to, we are told that his Adunayic name is Nimruzir. But it doesn't actually matter what name we go with, what matters is that it is a name Elendil is forced to adopt in order to survive, but it's a mask. It's something he rejects with every fibre of his being, and in secret he continues to be the leader of the faithful. He is the figurehead of the Numenorean resistance, but he has to do it behind closed doors, for he is a counsellor to the king, and the king's men are the enemies of the faithful. Also, potentially, Elendil's wife, another character we know nothing about, could play some role in this storyline. We could use her to explore the city of Romena, where the faithful have been forcibly relocated to, and they now live under the watchful eyes of the ruling king's men. Anyway, as season 3 nears its final act, the trajectory of this storyline should be clear. Farazon's grip on power becomes tighter and tighter, the king's men become more and more tyrannical, Elendil's faithful become more and more desperate, and as things near their breaking point, it seems that Farazon is willing to begin exterminating the faithful if they continue resisting his rule. When Elendil's role as the leader of these faithful is finally revealed, and Farazon realises that his childhood friend is actually the leader of his enemies, civil war can't 
possibly be avoided, right? Despite the friendship that once existed between them, Farazon and Elendil are now sworn enemies, and Miriel's efforts to drive Numenor's future away from the past now seems impossibly futile. Desire for deathlessness has brought the majesty of Numenor to the brink of self-destruction. Now, I'm aware there's a lot more that could be said about the storyline, and I'm sure you guys all have your own ideas about things to include, but before I come back to this part of the story and talk about the finale, I also want to talk about how I imagine Season 3 could explore those other three major characters, the younger generation of Numenorians, the ones who are destined to outlive their homeland. And through their stories, we can potentially tie Seasons 3 and 4 to Seasons 1, 2, and 5. But, as I said earlier, Tolkien tells us nothing about Isildur and Anarion during this period of their lives, and he tells us nothing about Isildur's wife, full stop. So we are going to have to invent things. And I certainly wouldn't say there's one right way to do this. Also, the version I came up with had like four or five days of thought put into it, so it's not going to be perfect. But I will say that I've tried to build this story path around the trees of Tolkien's writings, and I certainly haven't knowingly bulldozed through anything Tolkien wrote. So, I think Isildur, Anarion, and Eärendil should spend Season 3 exploring a totally different aspect of Numenor's storyline, the Numenorean colonies in Middle-earth. Which means our other three main characters are going to be leaving Numenor and sailing east across the Sundering Sea. Now, there's any number of reasons why this could be the case, but the justification I have thought up is that maybe Elendil had an agent of the faithful among Farazon's Numenorians in Pelagia. But when Farazon returned to Numenor, that agent wasn't among them. Maybe Farazon can say that this guy mysteriously disappeared while seeking information regarding three long dead lords of Numenor who lived in Middle Earth one and a half thousand years ago. So, Elendil sends his trusted sons to try and unravel the mystery of what happened to this guy. But I did find myself rolling my own eyes a little bit at the notion of Eärendil being sent with Isildur and Anarion. It's not a massive deal, but historically sailing has always been a very gender segregated enterprise. I'm not saying that's right, I'm just not sure how Tolkienian it is to have Elendil send his daughter-in-law on an important and potentially really dangerous mission to Middle-earth. However, a woman stowing away and disguising herself among men certainly does have a Tolkienian precedent, and I think we can use Aardian's decision to do this as a way of exploring just how significant of an undertaking it really is to make the journey across the ocean to Middle-earth. In Tolkien's writings, characters do not hop back and forth between Numenor and the mainland as if there was like a regular ferry service. We're never given specific measurements, but we know Numenor is a really long way from Middle-earth. And the characters that do go back and forth, you know, Aldarion, Farazon, that Halbrand guy from season one, they spend years at a time away from home. Isildur and Anarion are going off on a huge adventure, and maybe Eärendil might choose to join her future husband in secret rather than wait for what might be decades for his return. Perhaps she can stow away dressed as a man with the intention of revealing herself to Isildur when they are far enough out at sea that there's no turning back. However, taking inspiration from what Tolkien wrote in his second age story of Aldarion and Arendis, I think the ship of Isildur, Anarion, and Eärendil should be blown far to the north by a great storm in the Sundering Sea. And as the sailors desperately scramble to keep their vessel afloat, Eärendil should be washed overboard and lost among the waves. Now, it really annoys me when stories fake a character death, so I definitely think by the end of whatever episode this happens in, Eärendil should be revealed to be alive and washed up on the shore, because otherwise that's like emotional manipulation, and I think that's lazy writing. But by separating Eärendil from Isildur and Anarion, I think we have the opportunity to explore some really cool things that will place Season 3 within the wider context of Seasons 1 and 2. 
You may very well be thinking it's a little bit contrived to have a character just get swept away in a storm and then just happen to show up on the shore absolutely fine. And to be fair, yeah, it is kind of a bit convenient. But I am justifying it because we know where the Numenor storyline is going to go. We know that we need to spend some time establishing the more mythical parts of this narrative. And I think Aardian is the one who should do that. It'll be very interesting, I think, to see how faithfully Amazon adapts the whole Iluvatar thing in later seasons, but for casual Lord of the Rings fans, this is a pretty out there storyline. But if we put the work into season 3, I think we can earn that epicness in season 4. And, to give credit where credit is due, I do really like the name Aardian. It's completely made up, there is no Aardian in Tolkien's writings, but what it means is Daughter of Water or Daughter of the Sea. And although I'm aware this might not be everyone's cup of tea, I have come up with a storyline where we use Aardian to explore a theme that may not seem like a particularly big deal, but I was blown away by how relevant this actually is to the Numenor storyline, and that is this kind of weird mythical idea that in Tolkien's Legendarium there is power in water. Now, we don't have the rights to use the name Ulmo, that's the Lord of Waters, but we do know that in Season 4, the waves themselves are going to take a vested interest in the lives of certain Numenorians, including Aardian's husband. And I think that by maybe doing something cool with music here, we can demonstrate that there is power in water. And that power is far more profound than the elven magic or anything else we've seen before. It is the divine power in water that saves Aardian's life. So, bear with me here. I would suggest Aardian's Season 3 storyline, which should really be a tertiary storyline with a good bit less screen time than either Elendil or Isildur's narratives, it could go something like this. Aardian wakes up on the shore of Middle-earth, right here with no idea where she is and absolutely no one around her. She could not be more lost or alone. And because she's stowed away, no one's even looking for her. So she's absolutely screwed. But there is power in water. And due to some very mythical feeling that she can't quite understand, Aardian decides to follow the water. She follows the river. This river. The Guafalo. And here is another great example of the Second Age just kind of adapting itself. If we simply follow Tolkien's metaphorical trees, I think an awesome story just reveals itself, because Tolkien was really good at what he did. You see, in the only text Tolkien ever wrote concerning Galadriel's actions in the Second Age, we are given some awesome details about a couple of Numenorean colonies in this part of the world. However, what's cool is that these colonies are way older than what we'll see Isildur and Anarion exploring, and unlike the great cities of Pelargia and Umbar, these colonies in the north are utterly abandoned. But once upon a time, they represented the very best of Numenorean expansion. Even without those unfinished tales writings, The Lord of the Rings tells us about an ancient Numenorean ruin called Tharubad, which was built right on this river Aardian is wandering up. And we know that Tharubad was built in the early Second Age. It was here that the final battle in the War of the Elves and Sauron was fought. At Tharubad, the Numenorians and the Elves of Gilgalad utterly defeated Sauron's armies in the Season 2 finale. This city reached its prime in the good old days, when the Numenorians and the Elves were friends, when descendants of Halbrand and Gilgalad lived as neighbours. But now, it's all abandoned. And the great forests along the river where Wood Elves once walked back in Season 1, they've all been cut down. The later Numenorians of Tharbarad cut down these forests to acquire timber for their ships. And when the trees ran out, Tharabad fell into ruin. What we're basically doing here is just bridging that one and a half thousand year time jump between the end of Season 2 and the beginning of Season 3. Anyway, at Tharabad, Aardian will encounter a fork in her road. Two rivers she could follow. 
To her right lies the Glanduin, which runs down from the mountains of Khazad Doom, flows through the now war-scarred empty lands of Eregion, and even right past Celebrimbor's long-destroyed city of Ostina Veal, where we spent so much of seasons 1 and 2. But Aarien follows the left-hand river, and she continues all the way upstream until eventually in her exhaustion she collapses in the shallow waters of a ford and she drifts out of consciousness. Now, if you know your Middle Earth geography, you can probably tell where I'm going with this because this ford of the river Bruinen just so happens to be on the doorstep of perhaps our most important season 1 and 2 character, a guy who in the Lord of the Rings we know sets a precedent for helping desperate and weary travellers who make it to this very ford, Elrond. And I'm not just saying this to shoehorn a familiar face into the Numenor storyline. Elrond's storyline is, and always should have been, from the very first scene, inexorably linked to Numenor's. Aarion's husband is a distant descendant of Elrond's brother. And, of course, one day Aarion's youngest child will be raised in Rivendell by Elrond. In fact, most of her firstborn descendants will be raised in Rivendell all the way down to Aragorn. So, I don't necessarily think we need to explore much exposition or plot here. I don't imagine this being a conventionally exciting storyline in terms of like fight scenes or drama, but I think the profundity of the friendship that will go on to exist between Isildur's family and Elrond can begin here in season 3 with Aarian. I imagine her waking up to the sound of waterfalls in the homely house of Imladris. And we can see the extent to which Imladris has grown in the one and a half thousand years since its founding back in season two. And the beauty of this refuge is of course a real testament to Elrond's skill and wisdom and his ability to create wonders. Now he is over 3,000 years old. He is a young elf no longer. Also, just for the sake of being as nerdy as Tolkien was, there is another excellent opportunity here to explore language. As I mentioned earlier, throughout seasons 3 and 4, the common tongue, what we should translate into English, should be Adunayak. However, Elrond probably wouldn't speak Adunayak, and the very nerdy part of me thinks it would be really cool if the two actors playing Aarien and Elrond had some really long, thematically rich scenes of dialogue, but the whole thing was spoken in Sindarin, with subtitles. I imagine a studio would probably push back on that, it might lose some key demographics who don't like reading, and maybe I am taking these a little bit too far, but it would be the opposite of generic, and I think the opposite of generic is what a Tolkien adaptation should be shooting for. And it could also be really good character development. As a member of the faithful, Aarien would be familiar with some Sindarin, but it's a persecuted language back in Numenor. She would have to have learnt it in secret and she could never speak it openly. So when she first meets Elrond and he heals her, perhaps with the aid of his Ring of Power, her Sindarin would be rusty. But over the course of her storyline, she becomes more and more fluent, and by the end of the season, after she spent a really long time in Rivendell, Aarien is transformed into a much more spiritual and a much more wise character, with potentially even an elven air about her. All of this will be further explored in season 4 and 5. Also, one more thing that I really think should be included in any exploration of Numenor is the Aerendil story. Now, Eärendil is a First Age character who is super important in the Silmarillion, but he is totally talked about in The Lord of the Rings, and we totally do have the rights to everything we need. And the reason that this Eärendil story is so important to Numenor is because Eärendil was, among many other things, the father of Elros. He was the father of Numenor's first king. And the thing that Eärendil is most famous for doing is sailing west at the end of the First Age, and in so doing he basically saved the world and achieved deathlessness. Now, we know that at the end of Season 4, one of Eärendil's direct descendants, Farazon, 
will also sail west, but in so doing he will break the world in his desire for deathlessness. Pharazon is the absolute opposite of Eorendil in every conceivable way, yet there is a similarity between them. And what makes this even more fascinating is that from Eardian's mortal perspective, Eorendil is, you know, he's some ancient mythical figure who lived 3,000 years ago and he turned into a star. He would seem much more like a legend than a historical figure. The Eorendil story is, from a Numenorean perspective, a piece of mythology lost between the cracks of a nation's collective memory. However, from Elrond's perspective, Eorendil was his dad. Elrond literally remembers spending time with him. He remembers what Eorendil was like. I think this is a great way to demonstrate the difference between mortal and immortal understandings of history, whilst also tying the characters of Elrond and Elros back together and exploring that 3,000 year long timeline. So although I'm aware this probably wouldn't be every viewer's favourite storyline, I think it would be lovely. Anyway, while I'm on the topic of Rivendell and elves from seasons 1 and 2, I do think we should have at least a little bit of a check-in with Gil-galad's character. He's really not relevant to the Numenor story, so I think he should be used sparingly, but I imagine he could show up in Rivendell, meet Elrond's new mortal friend, Eardian, and he can explain that the reason he's journeyed from the sea to the mountains is because he is headed to the doors of Durin to try and reopen relations with the dwarves of Khazad Doom. Last time we saw the dwarves was one and a half thousand years ago when they shut the doors of Durin during the war with Sauron and they ended their long years of prosperous relationship with the Noldor. Now, I uh, backed myself into a corner, didn't I, with this whole language thing, because neither Gilgalad nor the dwarves would speak Adunayic, so this would also have to all be subtitled, and dwarves speaking Sindarin might seem a little bit off. But, actually, I'm not sure how much dialogue we really need here. This is mostly setting up Last Alliance stuff for Season 5, and I think most of the story can be told visually. In fact, in terms of dialogue, maybe less is more here. Perhaps Gil-galad can come to the doors of Durin, he can speak the password, Meldon, which he would have learned from Celebrimbor, and he can enter a very different kind of Khazad Doom to what we saw back in seasons 1 and 2. We should see the extent to which these subterranean mansions have grown in the one and a half thousand years since we last saw them, and also the extent to which these dwarves and their ancestors have spent their entire lives shut inside Khazad Doom, just tunneling and mining and excavating and turning their home into the absolute apex of dwarvendom in Middle-earth. Gil-galad can journey all the way into the heart of their realm and there, in some amazingly grand throne room, he will meet the new king of Khazad Doom. And this would, I think, be an appropriate time in the story to briefly introduce King Durin IV. And honestly, there is no reason that we can't use the same actor who played his ancestor Durin III in the previous seasons. Durin the Fourth is a brand new character, but according to the traditions of the Longbeards, all Durins are reincarnations of the original Deathless Durin. So I think by reusing the same actor, we can tie these two Durins together. Also, for reasons that I'll explain later, Eardian should totally go with Gilgalad, and she should pass through Khazad Doom to come out on the other side, where she begins following another river, the Silverlode, down into what will one day be Lothlorien. Anyway, as I say, this storyline is pretty self-contained and I don't want it taking up too much focus for itself. It really should just enrich the other storylines. And the storylines that really matter are the Elendil storyline and the Isildur storyline. So let's get back to Isildur and his brother Enarion and take a look at what I think they should spend season three doing. Which, if we examine Tolkien's writings, is just another case of the Second Age straight up adapting itself. Because, right, this is Pelagia, the haven of the Numenorean faithful in Middle-earth. And so, any sailor arriving by sea could only get to Pelagia by sailing up the mouths of Anduin, here, 
actually in pretty obscure writings that we definitely can't use. Pelagia was way closer to the coast at this point, and then later in the Second Age, the shoreline retreated, but that's neither here nor there, and it has no impact on the story. Incredibly close to where Isildur and Anarion would find themselves if they sailed to Pelagia is this region of Belfalas. And it just so happens that in the only relevant writings we have on this topic, Belfalas is at this time home to the wandering company of Galadriel, Celeborn, and Celebrian. Last time we saw them, they were kind of just wandering off into the wilds after the fall of Eregion, and one and a half thousand years later, here they are in the part of the world that will, by their timeless perspective, very soon become known as Gondor. And you can't talk about Gondor without Isildur and Anarion. So, I think there is another great opportunity here to set up some new things, pay off some old things, and expand on some invented storylines, but without projecting them onto Tolkien's writings. It's all already there. Anyway, as with everything, there are any number of ways that this could be written, but for the sake of exploring death and deathlessness, as well as tying this to the other main Numenorean storyline, I would suggest that Isildur and Anarion sail to Pelagia, and before they get there, they have all these expectations of what a faithful Numenorean haven might be like. But then when they do get there, I think we should find that even Pelagia is not free of the desire for deathlessness that is taking Numenor down such a dark path. And we can explore a little bit of Farazon's character here without actually having to show him on screen. While he is off in Numenor doing his thing with Elendil and Miriel, we can see that many Numenorians of the colonies consider Farazon to be their saviour. He is the guy who is making Numenor greater than it could possibly have been under Tar Palantir's rule. This is Farazon's legacy. And although from a Tolkienian perspective it is obviously awful, from the perspective of these Numenorians, Farazon has done great things. And the fact that even Pelagia has now been more or less purged of elven influence is considered a positive by the Kingsmen. But Isildur and Anarion know better. And I think their youthful naivety can be hardened a little bit by witnessing the reality of the period they're living in. Pelagia was founded by the faithful, but that was 900 years ago. And in recent decades, both Umbar and Pelagia have been reforged in Farazon's image. Perhaps we can see that the Elven-inspired architecture has been replaced with the King's Men's golden statues. And the once beautiful city is turning into just one more stronghold for plunderers and pirates. So, although I think there should still be some faithful influence, you know, Pelagia is a city after all, Isildur and Anarion are not representative of the average Numenorean that they find themselves rubbing shoulders with, which could potentially be what brings them into contact with Galadriel's Wandering Elves. I don't want to make too big of a deal of this, Galadriel should not be a central part of the Numenor storyline, but she was vital to seasons 1 and 2, and she does bear one of the titular Rings of Power, and we know that the land she's currently inhabiting will one day be yielded to Isildur and Anarion during their founding of Gondor. So I think this is the opportunity to explore her storyline as it pertains to Numenor. Also, just to tumble further down this language rabbit hole that I may be placing a little bit too much emphasis on, wouldn't it be cool if Galadriel and her elves spoke to Isildur and Anarion in English, but they use older, more archaic vocabulary than the other characters? This could reflect how Galadriel probably would know some Adunayic, she's been living for thousands of years adjacent to Numenorians in the south, but she would have learned their language a long time ago back when men were friendlier to the elves and the two kindreds were more philosophically united. In the centuries since then, Galadriel's company would have been shunned by the king's men of Numenor, and so their understanding of the Numenorean's language might be a little outdated. Anyway, I suggested earlier that the whole reason Isildur and Anarion came to Middle-earth could be because Elendil sent them there to uncover the mystery of a faithful Numenorean who disappeared while trying to uncover a mystery of his own a mystery concerning a shadow of the past. 
And so, maybe this Numenorian came to Galadriel and Celeborn before he disappeared, and now Isildur and Anarion are retracing his steps, which is what brings them down the river into the lands of Belfalas. Isildur and Anarion can get information from Galadriel and Celeborn about the guy they're searching for, and I think they should discover that the last time this guy was seen, he was heading north up the river Anduin into haunted lands that have recently fallen under a new shadow. Also, for plot reasons that I'll explain in a few minutes, I think it'd be very helpful if either Isildur or Anarion, or both, acquired elvish swords for their adventure. And considering Galadriel is a giver of gifts, let's say she gifts Isildur and Anarion two swords of Eregion, or potentially even swords of Gondolin. Anyway, as Season 3 moves forward, Isildur and Anarion should take the advice of Galadriel and Celeborn, and they should follow the river Anduin upstream just as this missing Numenorian did. Which, again, if you know your geography, you will be aware will take them up into the lands where they will eventually build their great cities of Minas Anor and Minas Ithil, which will of course go on to be known as Minas Tirith and Minas Morgul. In fact, the reason that this part of the world will one day be called Ithilien, which means the land of the moon, is because it is named for its lord Isildur, the servant of the moon, and on the opposite banks of the Anduin are the lands that will become Anorien, the lands of the sun which will one day be ruled by the son of the sun, Anarion. Anyway, I think the main focus of this journey up the Anduin should be upon the men who live here. The men that Isildur and Anarion will meet, but these men are not of Numenorean descent. These are middlemen. These are the people descended from the natives who lived here before the Numenorians came and built their colonies. A thousand years ago, the Numenorians were their friends, but in the days of Pharazon and the Kingsmen, that is no longer the case. And I think these middlemen of the South are a really important part of the story. We know that some of these men will eventually make peace with the faithful Numenorians and fight alongside them in the War of the Last Alliance, but others will feel such resentment towards the black Numenorians who plundered their homes and their livelihoods that they will fight with Sauron. So, there's a lot to explore here. We've got Sauron's manipulation of the middlemen, we've got the big picture consequences of Numenor's corruption from a non-Numenorian perspective, we have themes of hope and despair, and of course, what happens when fear of death and desire for deathlessness infect mannish mindsets. And I guess there is a potential for another invented storyline here that can involve some middlemen of Harad and their interactions with the Numenorians of Umbar. These people will be the ancestors of the Haradrim from the Lord of the Rings, and from their perspective, we can maybe explore why it is that so many of their descendants will go on to hate the Dúnedain so much in the Third Age. Pharazon's Numenorians are, to an extent, doing Sauron's work for him. But we should also see that as with all men, there are some people of Harad who resist. There are some Haradrim who share the wisdom of Isildur and Anarion and Elendil. But in these dark days towards the end of the Second Age, they are becoming outnumbered. Conflict and division among people who by rights should be friends needs to be a big part of the season. And there's a great line in The Fellowship of the Ring that articulates this really well. Indeed, in nothing is the power of the Dark Lord more clearly shown than in the estrangement that divides all those who still oppose him. The conflict of the Middlemen and the Numenorians illustrates what makes Sauron so dangerous, and it'll go a long way in setting up the final season. Anyway, for now I will focus and I will stick with Isildur and Anarion's storyline. As they journey upstream, they can interact with a few different communities of middlemen, some of whom might fear these Numenorean lords, others who might be curious about the elvish blades they carry. But all men demonstrate a fear of what lies on the other side of the river, the eastern bank, and the mountains of shadow that run parallel to it. 
Now, I think a big part of this storyline should involve slowly peeling back the layers of a sinister mystery that connects seasons 3 to seasons 1 and 2. And at the heart of this mystery are those three lords of Numenor, those lords of old who lived in this part of the world one and a half thousand years ago, back when the colonies were young and before even Pelagia or Umbar were built. But the story of these three lords is almost completely unknown. That's what Isildur and Anarion and the guy whose footsteps they're retracing are trying to uncover. For reasons that no mortal can now remember, these three lords of Numenor were declared traitors to their own people, their names were mysteriously erased from all records, and the circumstances of their deaths is now entirely lost except for dark legends that persist among the middle men, frightening tales of three guys who feared death and apparently discovered a way to be free of it. Anyway, I don't think Isildur or Anarion would necessarily believe these superstitions of the locals, but in all the myriad of stories they hear, there is one constant. On the eastern bank of the Anduin, in the foothills of the Mountains of Shadow, there is an evil valley a place where even the Numenorians do not dare to venture. And at the end of this valley lives a community of middle men, a group of men who all other men fear. However, it is towards this evil valley that our missing Numenorian was last seen headed, and so it is towards this valley that Isildur and Anarion must journey. But. As they cross the river and enter into this evil part of the world, they discover that they are being watched by an incredibly sinister group of middle men. And again, if you're familiar with Middle Earth's geography, then you'll know that I'm not making this up out of nothing. This evil valley that lies right before the Mountains of Shadow is the same valley that will, in the Lord of the Rings, be called the Morgul Vale. Frodo, Sam, and Gollum will make this exact journey in just over 3,000 years. And, of course, upon the very ground where Isildur now stands, he will one day build his great city of Minas Ithil, which is, of course, destined to be conquered by the Nazgul twice. So, let's say this evil cult of middlemen, who I imagine would have the lidless eye as their symbol, they approach Isildur and Anarion, they surround them, and our heroes demand information from them about the guy they are seeking. And over the course of some fairly sinister dialogue, we can learn that this missing Numenorian was in fact murdered by these cultists, human sacrificed maybe even, and after their treachery and their malice is revealed, they try to murder Isildur and Anarion in the exact same way. However, these two brothers have each other's back, they aren't taken unawares, and with their elven blades that they were gifted by Galadriel, they slay all but one of the cultists. And so the last surviving cultist is taken prisoner, and it is from them that we can reveal the full story of the mystery that the sons of Elendil have spent this season unravelling. I would suggest that this cultist, either he or she, should be taken prisoner by Isildur and Anarion, and interrogated until eventually they agree to take the brothers to the place where the three ancient lords of Numenor can be found. And I guess in the hopes that discovering where these traitorous Numenorians were entombed might reveal some answers, Isildur and Anarion follow this cultist to the far end of the valley and there they find a secret stair that has been cut into the Mountains of Shadow by the ancestors of these cultists. And these stairs will of course one day be known as the Stairs of Kirith Ungol. Which means you can almost certainly tell where I'm going with this. However, as in all cases like this, I imagine there's a temptation to over-feature a familiar face, and it really annoys me in prequels and remakes and things when a character says a name from the original as if it's like a really huge deal and there's this big kind of dun-dun-dun moment, except that name wouldn't mean anything to the characters in the scene, and that's the case here. Shelob is a name that fans will recognise, it is relevant to this part of the story, it can be included, but that name would mean nothing to Isildur or Anarion, and so I think any potential Shelob revelation in this part of the story would have much more impact if it's really understated. 
I don't think Isildur and Anarion should really get a clear glimpse of Shelob. They don't know what she is, they just know enough to be afraid. Anyway, at the top of the stairs, this cultist leads them to the Pass of the Spider. And with no direction but forward, Isildur and Anarion enter Shelob's lair. And this is 100% of the reason why I suggested earlier that Galadriel should give at least one of them an elvish sword. In Lord of the Rings, we are explicitly told that Sam Gamgee's Dunedain dagger, his blade of Numenor, cannot cut through Shelob's webbing, but Frodo's sword Sting can. So, just for the sake of not contradicting anything, it would make sense for at least one of them to have an elvish blade in this scene. I think we can use the fear of the cultists to explore that something evil is watching them in the darkness. But as Isildur and Anarion come out on the other side, they discover why it is that these mountains of shadow are so feared. The land on the other side of them, that they now find themselves in, is Mordor. And maybe as they draw near to where we know the tower of Kirith Ungol will one day be built by their descendants, their elven blades begin to glow blue. The truth is revealed. The orcs that Farazon and his Numenorean colonists have spent decades so proudly slaying for the good of their empire, they aren't random warbands from the Misty Mountains, they aren't a mindless rabble that just happens to be roaming the south, they are part of the vast army of Mordor, the army of Sauron that has been growing for a single purpose. One and a half thousand years ago, back in season two, the Numenorians joined forces with the elves and they robbed Sauron of an early victory. And so, during all those long years, while time has turned history and memory into myth and legend among the Numenorians, Sauron has not forgotten. On the one hand, I guess his presence in Middle-earth and the dark years that he's ruled through may seem completely separate to the fate of Numenor far in the west, but that's kind of the whole point of the Second Age. Nothing is separate from Sauron. And now Isildur knows it. From the steps leading out of Shelob's lair, he can look over the plateau of Gorgoroth and see the army that Sauron has spent so long gathering. But this still doesn't quite uncover the mystery of those Numenorean lords, and sensing that they've been led into a trap, Isildur and Anarion demand that the cultists tell them the truth, right now. Why is it that their people worship these long dead lords of Numenor? How did they die, and where are they buried? But, as we the audience all know, that's just the thing. They didn't die, they are still out there. In fact, they're right here, in Mordor. The reason those lords of Numenor from a thousand years ago matter to this story, the reason they are worshipped by the middlemen, is because they achieved that thing which so many men desire. Deathlessness. One and a half thousand years ago, they accepted a gift, a ring of power, and because of it, they are still alive. Perhaps Isildur and Anarion begin to feel that dread, that fear for which the Nazgul are so well known. And then we see them, all nine ringwraiths, appearing all around Isildur and Anarion 3,000 years before we will see them in the Lord of the Rings. I think the cultist should try and stab Isildur in the back, but Inarion saves him and slays the cultist, and then the nine Nazgul bear down on our Numenorean heroes. Now, there are any number of ways that we could get Isildur and Anarion out of this tricky situation that we've placed them in, but for the sake of drawing things out of Tolkien's writings instead of projecting it onto them, I would take inspiration from The Lord of the Rings, where we see Frodo invoke the elven phrase Elbereth Gilthorniel, which we know the Nazgul really don't like. And because in Tolkien's writings, the Nazgul are not warriors, they are so much more than that, and because there is power in the elven language, it's what gives the faithful their strength, Isildur and Anarion use their elven blades and they're able to kind of fight their way out, escape back into Shelob's lair, and hurry as fast as they can to the other side. Any orcs who may be chasing them could stop at the mouth of the pass, they know of the terror that dwells inside. And so as Isildur and Anarion run through the pass of the spider, their blades cease to glow. It's completely dark. 
and I think this would be the opportunity to have Shelob feature as like an actual character, a part of the story and not just fan service. But as I say, I really do reckon less is more here. Perhaps we can see the shape of her legs moving in the darkness, we can hear her hiss and catch just enough of a glimpse to understand why it is that in the future Isildur will name this place Kirith Unigol, the Pass of the Spider. We know that some kind of monster is chasing them, and we know that the terror of the Nazgul is still flowing through Isildur and Anarion. So they swipe blindly with their blades and they just run. The whole scene is chaos, it's fear, it's darkness, until they finally make it out to the other side. I imagine them basically falling down the stairs of Kirith Ungol in their hurry to escape this evil place, but as they make it to the bottom, Isildur should turn and he should hear the screech of the Nazgul coming from the pass behind him. It's just a little bit of foreshadowing to remind us that in Season 5, in this exact spot, Isildur will face the Nazgul again during the first fall of Minas Ithil. However, after this really panicked, frenzied, stressful scene, I think it should be followed by a much more methodical, almost ritual scene featuring Sauron himself in all his glory with the one ring upon his finger, standing at the absolute pinnacle of his might, the lord of the earth, the king of all men, opening the black gate and emerging from Mordor to unleash his orc army upon the Numenorians. Now that the cat's out of the bag, he has no more need for patience. As Isildur and Anarion hurry back to Pelagir, Sauron sends his army south through the lands that will one day be Ithilien, across the lands of the Middlemen, and down the Anduin towards the Numenorean colonies. Which means now our two main storylines can start coming back together. Somehow Isildur is going to have to send a message to Numenor informing his father and his king that the colonies are under attack and not just by a random warband of orcs but by the great army of Sauron himself. And there are any number of ways that he could do this, I guess the most obvious would be through the use of a palantir, but in the appendices we are told that the palantiri of Middle-earth were brought by Elendil after Numenor's downfall, and they are referred to as the Seven with like a capital S, which means the fact that the Seven of them is part of the lore, and so it would contradict Tolkien's writings to have a palantir already in Middle-earth. So for the sake of not breaking my own rule, we'll have to think up some other way to pass information back and forth between Numenor and Middle-earth. But as with most things, Tolkien does give us enough to work with here, and in The Hobbit we are told of quite a few examples of men using birds to carry messages. And of course, messenger pigeons are a real thing in the real world. Also, gulls and seabirds are something that Tolkien wrote a lot about in reference to Numenor's culture. So my suggestion would be that Isildur ties his message to like the ankle of some trained gull in Pelagia, and he then sends it across the sea back to Numenor bearing his message. Anyway, Sauron's armies attacking Pelagia isn't described in any detail in any of Tolkien's writings, but we are told that he put forth his might and pressed down upon the cities by the coasts and declared his purpose to drive the Numenorians into the sea. So at least something similar to this did happen during the latter part of the Second Age. And honestly, I imagine Pelagia would fall pretty quickly. Sauron's army would be upon it before the divided kingsmen and faithful can put aside their differences to put up much of a defence. And so after the city is overrun, Isildur and Anarion lead the survivors of Pelagia by ship, and they would sail south to the greatest of all the Numenorean strongholds in Middle-earth, Umbar, the haven of the king's men. Now, considering how Season 3 is going to end, I don't think Sauron should be leading his own army in person, he should stay in Mordor, but this story has had such a heavy focus on the Nazgul, so in my mind they are the obvious secondary villains to put in charge here. Perhaps we can see Sauron's hateful army corrupting and perverting and polluting Pelagir after it's emptied, which kind of foreshadows next season, but as Season 3 nears its finale, we should have Sauron's army descending on Umbar. 
and we should get to see what a siege would be like when nine of the besiegers have the power to induce fear and sickness and corruption, and the besieged have spent centuries fighting among themselves. Isildur and Anarion have found themselves trapped in the havens of their ideological enemies, with the Nazgul and like a million orcs on the outside, and the hatred of their fellow Numenorians on the inside. But that is where I will leave the Sons of Elendil for the moment, because at this point in the story, unbeknownst to either Isildur and Anarion, the conflict back home in Numenor has turned from tension to seemingly unavoidable civil war. And it's while this conflict is boiling to a breaking point that Isildur's message should reach the palace of the king in Armenelos. But before Pharazon receives news of Sauron's attack on the colonies, the message should be intercepted by agents of Miriel. And as awful as the unleashing of Mordor may seem to everyone else, from Miriel's perspective, this could actually be a positive. All season long, she has been searching for a way to unite her people behind a common cause, and this could finally be it. I imagine Miriel taking Isildur's message to her husband slash cousin slash co-ruler slash enemy and telling Pharazon that everything he achieved as a captain of the colonies is now under threat from Sauron, a guy who is calling himself the King of Men. And despite Pharazon's astounding villainy, I guess there is one positive thing to say about him, and that is that, well, at least at this point in the story, Pharazon hates Sauron. So, for the sake of Numenor's colonies and the legacy of Pharazon and the Sons of Elendil, Miriel fosters an incredibly tenuous truce between Pharazon's people and Elendil's. For if there is one thing that all Numenorians do agree on, it's this. Sauron is not their king. Not yet, at least. And so, as season 3 reaches its finale, the King's Men and the Faithful gather in the port city of Romena, and for the second time in this TV show, a massive fleet of Numenorians set sail to Middle-earth to declare war on Sauron. However, whereas in the season 2 finale, this was like a really feel-good heroic moment, now it's a lot more complicated. And I imagine as this fleet departs Numenor, Miriel would watch them disappear, much like how Eowyn watches the Rohirrim disappear as they ride off to do war with Saruman. In both cases, Miriel and Eowyn know that if the king doesn't return, all his power and responsibility will pass to them, and yet they have no control over what's going to happen. It's a pretty stressful position for a ruler to be in. Anyway, back in Umbar, things are getting more and more and more desperate for the besieged Numenorians. As the Nazgul and their immense army starves the haven towards submission, we have another opportunity to explore a just how ugly the division among the Numenorians truly is, and b just how heroic Isildur and Anarion really are when the going gets tough. These guys are destined to be kings, and this is a good chance to demonstrate why. But then, just as all seems lost, Pharazon's gold and scarlet sails appear on the horizon, and Umbar is saved by the coming of the king's fleet. There is, of course, an opportunity here for like an epic battle sequence, although Tolkien actually writes that when Pharazon's fleet arrived at Umbar, the army of Sauron fled at the sight of them. And as the King of the Sea and his Numenorean army marched north towards the Black Gate of Mordor, the lands were empty and silent around them. The might of the Numenorean army is so incalculable that all servants of the enemy flee before them, and Pharazon's warriors, along with Elendil's and all those that were trapped in Umbar, march up to Mordor without even a single shred of resistance. Which brings us to the very thing that all of Season 3 has been building to. The Numenorians establish their vast camp right outside the Black Gate, and now it's Mordor's turn to be besieged. Opposites have exchanged places. 
The might of Numenor at the absolute peak of its military power is unveiled, and at the head of it all, the greatest army ever to walk through Middle-earth since the Elder Days is Pharazon the Golden. But Elendil is there too, with his sons and with his faithful, and the conflict that has defined this entire season hasn't gone anywhere. So, it is at this point, with a very divided Numenorean army laying siege to Mordor, that I would bring Aarien back into the story. The last time we saw her, she had passed through Khazad-dûm with Gil-galad and journeyed down the Silverlode River into the Sylvan woodland of Lindorinand, where she encounters the Wood Elves who will one day become the Elves of Lothlorien, and from them she receives gifts and knowledge, and then she takes one of their boats down the River Anduin, past the spot where her husband will one day be immortalised in the statue of the Aragonath, and all the way down to the Falls of Rauros. And again, all we have to do is look at Tolkien's map here to reveal how this story should go. Because at the Falls of Rauros, Aarien is now pretty close to where our other major character will be. All she has to do is pass through the wetlands of Nindalf, the dead marshes, they're only a fraction of the size they'll be in the Lord of the Rings, so that's not really an issue. And then, when she's past that, she is right where she needs to be, at the Black Gate. Also, and I don't think we need to focus on this, season 5 would be the time to explore this storyline properly, but the part of the world that Aarien would travel through as she makes her way down the Anduin is the very part of the world where in the Second Age the gardens of the Entwives could be found. In the Second Age the forest of Fangorn grew all the way up to the west bank of the Anduin, and on the other side were the gardens of the Entwives. Aarien would be heading east, and the only reason Ents even exist is because they were created by a specific one of the Valar. Aarien is all about exploring the Valar and their role in the world, so if we want to introduce Entwives, this would be a decent opportunity, I think. Anyway, Aarien's role in the finale is simple. She just sort of chances upon her people, except, you know, if chance it were, chance in Tolkien's works, especially The Hobbit, is very much just another word for that higher power who is ever present but never seen, aka Iluvatar. Anyway, Aarien chances upon the Numenorean army, and she is finally reunited with her future husband Isildur and the rest of the faithful warriors. However, she is also among all of the Kingsmen and Farazon himself, and Aarien is now quite a different character to who she was when we met her. The events of Season 3 span five years, which means Aarien has spent these five years following the waters of Middle-earth, and in so doing befriending elves, Elrond, Gilgalad, wood elves, even Entwives, and only ever speaking to them in Sindarin. She is now such an elf friend, everything that she is wearing, her hair, her jewellery, all of it, is in an elven style. She has been so ennobled, and among the faithful it would seem almost a miracle that Elendil's daughter-in-law kind of appears out of the mist, but from the perspective of the King's Men, she's sort of like a witch. A mysterious figure to be shunned, for she represents the absolute antithesis of their anti-elven worldview. Which means, of course, Aarien's return to the Numenorians only exacerbates the animosity between the Faithful and the Kingsmen. And, as has been happening all season long, the Numenorians inch closer and closer to violent conflict. But, then, the Black Gate opens. Once again, the Numenorians must temporarily put aside their differences to fight a common enemy. But from the lands of Mordor comes no army of orcs, nor Haradrim, nor even Nazgul. Instead, it is Sauron alone who emerges from Mordor to meet with Pharazon. And unlike in all his previous appearances, Sauron looks humble in this moment. His form is nowhere near as majestic as when he called himself Anatar. It's nowhere near as awe-inspiring as when he was Sauron, the lord of the earth. Now, he's just some guy who knows he does not have what it takes to beat Pharazon. Or so it seems. Sauron approaches the Golden King, he kneels at his feet, and he surrenders. Sauron pays homage to Pharazon, and Pharazon takes Sauron prisoner. 
So, season three ends with Sauron's surrender, his capture, and his journey to Numenor in chains. Now, I'll talk about the very last scene of the season in just a sec, but before I do, I think there should also be a short scene where we pay off Galadriel's season three storyline. In the Lord of the Rings appendices, we are told that three days after the destruction of the One Ring, you know, the final downfall of Sauron, Galadriel travelled to Dol Guldur, and she used her power to cleanse it, to expel the lingering evil, and to make it good again. So, I think we can take inspiration from that moment at the end of the Third Age and showcase a similar moment in the Second Age. A few days after the Numenorians set sail back home with Sauron as their prisoner, Galadriel can come to Pelagir. And for the sake of the friendship that she once had with the Numenorians a thousand years ago, and for the sake of the friendship that she made much more recently with Isildur and Anarion, she uses her powers of preservation to cleanse Pelagir of the shadow and the blight that the Nazgul placed upon it, and she ensures that for millennia to come, Pelagir will always be a place where the enemies of the faithful are overcome. All the way up to Aragorn's defeat of the Corsairs there, just before the Battle of Pelennor Fields. Anyway, the final scene of Season 3. I imagine it beginning with Miriel, looking east from Numenor, and seeing the sails of Farazon's vast fleet approaching. And with a bit of really good acting and some lovely music, we can convey the complex cocktail of emotions that Miriel must be feeling without any need for dialogue. The kind of relief that Farazon and Elendil are both still alive, tinged with the foreboding that Farazon and Elendil are both still alive. But then the focus shifts to the ships, and we see each of our other main characters reacting to the sight of their homeland fast approaching in the west. First, we should show Sauron, hunched over, humiliated, and chained up on the deck of Farazon's flagship. Then we see Farazon in all his might, and all his pride, and all his folly, the ultimate conqueror, the ultimate king, who in his mind has no equal in the entirety of Arda. But then the focus shifts again to Elendil, and Isildur, and Anarion, the leaders of the faithful, the rebels returning to a home in which they are no longer welcome. And then there is Aarien, the most mystical of all the Numenorians, who is so profoundly different upon her return than she was when she left. And then finally the camera turns back to Sauron. But this time the camera does not linger on his chains, we see his hand, his finger, and the shadow of the one ring hidden upon it. Then we see his face, and his smile, and we realize that this whole thing is going exactly the way he planned it. He could never have conquered Numenor on his own, the power in water is way beyond him, the island is unconquerable. The only thing that could bring down the empire of Numenor is Numenorians. And in Farazon's outrageous arrogance, the golden king of Numenor has believed himself mighty enough to make Sauron his prisoner. In his profound folly, he is delivering the Dark Lord to the exact place he wants to be. And so, as the final scene cuts to black, we are left with the knowledge that Sauron now stands on the brink of his ultimate win. There can be no turning back. Sauron has come to Numenor, and the end is about to begin. So, those are my thoughts on how the first half of a Numenor storyline should be told. The first half of the middle part of a Second Age trilogy. And uh, I had every intention of also talking about season 4 in this video, but it's just so long. I don't know why I've lost the ability to make short videos, but I have. Anyway, I will end this video here, but I promise very soon I will release another video talking through how I imagine season 4. 
forward go and kind of telling the second half of this Numenor storyline. The downfall, the apocalypse that is now able to happen because Sauron has come to Numenor. So keep your eyes open for that, hopefully I'll be able to upload it pretty soon, I have already written it. But to make sure you don't miss it when it comes, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and hit like and leave a comment and share this video with your friends if you want to. However, as always, until next time my dear friends, much love, stay groovy, and Nevaya Melanine.